Uh, I want to, uh, I, 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 if you have a Bible today, go ahead and turn to Luke 15. All right, if you know about the Bible, it, it, uh, it is one of, those, um, one of those passages that's real well known. Uh, probably the second most well-known passage in all of the Bible. The first being probably Psalm 23, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. And, uh, but there's, there's specific things I want to share with you today because of some of the things that, that we've been doing and what we've been focusing on probably over the last couple of months, really. And I just, uh, I want to continue that today and want to kind of give you a different look. Uh, but uh, we have been talking um, uh, about, uh, about whatever it takes. Basically, this, this job God has given to us, this responsibility, this directive, whatever you want to call it, but it's if those that are his, right? He's called us to make sure that the world around us, the people in our lives, at least, uh, know the message of Christ, either, either through us, right, or bringing them to something or something like that. So we started several, you know, several many weeks ago, really now, and, um, and we, 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 talked about, we talked about this subject, is that Jesus made this statement. He said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So the thought there is, is that those who follow Jesus, this is going to be on their hearts, okay? Why? Because Jesus is at work in your life that that will be on your heart. Uh, fishers of men, so basically that was a metaphor because everybody Jesus was talking to at that time uh, you know, was a fisherman. And so uh, if you remember, he talked to them. It's not about that it's it's all about you. It's, it's, it's about something else because Jesus, if you remember, they'd fished all night, didn't catch anything. Jesus said, go put it over there. They did and they didn't and there, there was, the net wasn't big enough. So, so again, it's not about us. Uh, it's about him working through us. It's a pretty cool thing when you think of it. But the one thing that I was real excited about with this series is that I knew everybody in our church, right? Everybody who is truly his right? You're going to want to be in on this. Because if you're his, Jesus said he is at work in your life, all right, to, to make you a fisher of men. So, so I, that, that was kind of how we started out. That's what it is. So what we started doing now that we've been into this couple of months, um, we had you do a list, you know, and we gave you the wallpaper for your phone. If you still would like to get in on that, you know, because I know we have a, a lot of winter residents coming down, you know, and, and so if you're brand new today, you can go online, right? And there's a little place where you, if you want to download the wallpaper, you know, uh, for your phone. And, and basically it's just three to five names of people that are in your life that you believe God's given you a heartbeat for just to pray for them, just to start praying for them. And, um, and so we've been praying for people. And uh, now over the last few months, and we, we, we saw what we told you, we were gonna give you opportunities to bring them, right? If you wanna share with them, share. Remember, it's not about what you do, how you do, it's about that you do it, right? Because it's, not, it's just your responsibility to share it. You're gonna see it all today. It's a, it's a cool look today. And so we'll get to it in just a minute. And so we've given you several, we did, we did Tim Tebow, and Tim did an excellent job at just sharing just the simple gospel message. In fact, there are several here today that you put your faith and trust in Christ. When, when Tim shared the, just the message, uh, Tim didn't make any, any difference other than just sharing the message with you. Um, it's basically his work in us. So it's a, it's, a, it's a cool thing. So we've been praying for people. And we're gonna pray at the end of the service today, right? If you it just did, that's the way we've been doing it. And so, and then this coming week, right? We're giving you a, a couple other looks. Uh, Lecrae will be here uh, Thursday, and uh, we've, we've made those uh, tickets. Uh, if you don't know who he is, then you probably don't want to come. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I, I, I mean, I, uh, but, but he really is powerful in, in the lyrics that he shares, and it's just a different music style, but we did it on purpose. We're doing a lot of those so that people can bring, right? People can bring different folks that they know that they would really enjoy that venue. So, so, uh, so that's this coming Thursday, right? If, uh, if you haven't bought your tickets, you can do that. And, uh, and then also, uh, we're doing an entirely different one on Friday. Uh, David McMillan, who used to be here, right? David and Susie. And uh, oh, we got a few of you. Yeah, if y'all remember him. And uh, uh, of course you do. It's only been a couple of three years ago. So anyway, he's coming. They're going to put together kind of a country feel, right? And, uh, and it'll be outside at the Jamboree, right? By the way, get your fritter faces on, right? Get your fritter, you know. 
Anyway, so they're going to do an entirely different, and I'm going to come out and share uh, the, 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 the gospel about three quarters of the way in just so that people will hear it. Right, So if you have people in your life that like either of those, then invite them. Then we have the Christmas musical. Guys, this is one of the biggest things we do. Over 5,000 people came to our Christmas musical over three services last year. And it's just a great opportunity to invite people. I know that's, how, that's what happened for me. I was 21. And uh, somebody invited me to go to a Christmas musical. And it was a Friday night. And so I said, okay. You know, and I went with them. And it was interesting how God used that. So you never know what he's going to do. We have Christmas Eve services. And we have a lot of things going on. But the key to it is, all right, just to start praying for people people in your life. So that's what we've been doing. And we've been talking about a whole lot over the last weeks about our responsibilities, who God's called us, how, how we all fit together, you know, to link together to do this and different things. But today's title is perspective. Perspective. Perspective is an amazing thing. You know, it's, it's why you and I, God doesn't want us to judge because most of the time when you and I judge others, we're wrong. I mean, seriously, because we don't have the right perspective. You just don't. Those who are highly critical and judgmental of others, right, usually don't realize uh, the, the perspective. You know, I don't know how many of you came to the marriage conference. That's been a few months ago now. We've had so much going on, by the way. It's been really cool. But the guy told one little story that I thought was so cool. And I'm, I'm going to remember it because you're going to hear it several times, I promise. But it's this whole thought, you know, it was a story about up in, uh, up, in the, up in the New York area, I believe it was, that it was a subway. And a guy got on with his two kids and he's sitting there, kind of just sitting there passively in a, in a seat. And the two kids were all over the subway car, right? Screaming and yelling. And, and finally, you know, everybody's looking over. They've already judged this man, right? He's a permissive dad that doesn't know how to, to keep control of his kids, right? So the kids are going bonkers. And finally, a man spoke up and said, sir, will you please do something about your kids? And he didn't answer. He just stared off. Finally, he got the man's attention. And, and he looks over and he, and he said, I'm, I'm sorry. And so basically, what, what just happened was uh, they just come from the hospital. His wife had passed away. And the two kids' mother. He said, I, yeah, yeah. He's in shock, basically. All right, now listen, nothing changed, right? But that man's perspective, who had already prejudged him, changed. Are you hearing me? And nothing changed, but he just got the right perspective. Perspective is incredible, guys. Perspective is unbelievable when you really can get a good one. So here's the difference today's gonna be like, all right? Today, I'm going to give you God's perspective, not because I know it, but because it shares it here in the scripture. What is his perspective in this area we're talking about? How does he look at it? All right now, we're not told much in the scriptures about God's perspective, but when we are, it's pretty amazing to, to just look at it just a little bit because it teaches us a little bit more about, 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 because there's so much mystery and the scripture even shares that there's mystery here. All right. So so first thing I want to talk to you about is, is, is God's heart, God's heart, because there's a little peek into it here in, in, a, in a series of stories that Jesus told. Now, Luke 15 is the parable of the prodigal son. Most everybody knows it, but a lot of times all you hear is, is, the, is the story itself and then it explained, and I've been guilty of that. But today, I want you to know we're going we're gonna to have a little narrower, narrower focus and I want you to see totally why the parable of the prodigal son was shared. And, it, and it, was, it was not just one story. It was three that all said the same thing. Jesus told three stories, right? He, 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 he told the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son, right? That is these three parables, and they all say the same thing. And it's amazing when you get the context. So I'm gonna, we're gonna go through a couple of verses that tell you why Jesus told the stories. And then when you, and, and, and then when you get the context, and then when you get what the point is, all right, of these three. Now, let's go ahead and jump right into it. All right, and get, first of all, let's get the context, all right? Chapter 15, verse one. Now the tax collectors 
and the sinners were all drawing near to hear him, that is Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't speak like everybody else. He had a message. And these outcast folks that are talked about here, tax collectors and sinners. Now, you have to remember, I've told you this before, but I'm gonna tell you again, tax collectors were, were, were hated at this time. And okay, it's not that they're loved now, all right? But, but they have a job to do, right? And all that. But back then, you have to understand the, the culture and the time in which. Uh, Israel was a conquered country. Uh, they were under Roman rule. <clears throat> I've told you before that Rome, uh, they didn't have many rules, right? But the couple that they, they if, you, if you behaved yourself and you paid your taxes, they would usually leave you, leave you alone. But the Romans have been doing it for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so they knew that in a con conquered country, the, the best person to recruit to be a tax collector was someone who was from that country because they knew everybody, knew who had the money, right? Knew who was successful, that kind of stuff. And so they would take up the taxes and give it to the Roman Empire and, uh, and they, would, they would get paid well and then a lot of times they would get a cut themselves. And so they were extremely wealthy, but they were considered traitors, right? And nobody would associate with them. So the only people they could have as friends were quote the, the ones who, weren't, who didn't mind being seen with them. Does that make sense? In fact, it, it, you know, somewhere on the social scale, right? Tax collectors were, were below the prostitutes in this particular area. I mean, seriously. And so it's, it's basically those who were outcast, those who were shunned, those who were excluded, um, however you wanna look at it. These were the ones that loved coming to hear Jesus. I find that interesting. He had a message for them, and they were drawn to it, right? Now, remember, whenever God's working, okay, you're always gonna have resistance and people against it. And I hate to say it, but it's usually the religious people, right? The people hardest on you, if you're trying to do what God wants you to do, usually will be other religious people. Not the lost world, right? You will have some problems with them, but the greatest struggle you're gonna have is with the religious, okay? Now, verse two, the religious people step in. The Pharisees and the scribes grumbled. Now, the Pharisees, I've already talked about them. They were a religious sect, right? And they were very conservative, very disciplined, you know, but with that self-righteousness comes a real judgmental attitude toward everybody else, right? And then the scribes were the academics of their day right? They were real versed in reading, writing, and translating from one language to another. And so they were highly respected, right? But both were religious people. And it says that these two groups grumbled. I love that, that term grumbled, right? It, it, it's one of those words that sounds like what it means. You know, grumble, 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 grumble. Yeah. You know, let me tell you though, guys, we're always going to have these people with us, right? Just don't be one, right? They're gonna, be, they're gonna be critical just about everything you try to do, right? And, and what were they critical of here? They were critical of Jesus for associating with sinners and even, even what? Eating with them, right? And I, I don't know. Jesus had his greatest struggles with these people, right? But, you know, he also told, told them what he thought of them, right? He, uh, he called them blind, leaders of the blind. He called them, Jesus called these religious people whitewashed tombs. In other words, you're real painted on the outside, you look great, but inside, you're, full, you're, you're, jet, you're dead. So, so anyway, so it was this charge Jesus, I can't believe you're going, who you're associating with, that Jesus told these three parables that you and I know so well. And I think it's gonna come alive to you, right? When you take a look at it, it's pretty powerful, right? Is that he, 
He, he associates with sinners, right? Now, here's one thing I want to tell you. The parable of the prodigal son, which we're not going to talk about today, but just, for, just so you'll know, all right? There were actually two sons in the parable of the prodigal son, right? We're only going to talk about the first one. That was the youngest one. But notice here in verses one and two, you have the sinners, tax collectors and sinners. That is, that is the younger son in Jesus' story. The older son is represented with the Pharisees and the scribes. I don't have time to talk about that today, all right? So we're only gonna talk about the younger one. Right? Now, here we go, all right? So look at verse 13. So he told them, so means because of, all right? He told them this parable. Actually, there are three. Again, they all say the same thing. But this whole, you know, I can't believe Jesus is you're eating with sinful people, right? And in reality, guys, if, if, if all of us are honest, I mean, who in the room's not a sin, sinner, right? And who in the room who truly is a believer, right? And God's grace has changed your life and you know it had nothing to do with you. Who in the room is gonna, is gonna, is gonna stand in judgment of someone else if you're his, right? Because outside of God's grace, as, as the saying goes, you, you could be just right there. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? No, you don't know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. I mean, it's just the way it is. So uh, anyway, but let's continue. And and he tells these three parables. Let's talk about them, all right? All right. First one is the parable of the lost sheep. It says this, which man of you or what man of you, all right, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, right, is he not going to leave the other 99, right? And he's going to go off, all right, looking for the one that he lost, Now, in all three of these stories, lost sheep, lost coin, uh, lost son, it all represents something very valuable to to the owner, right? Um, And and, and the first one is is a shepherd. Second one's a lady who'd lost money, and then we'll talk about that in a minute. And the other one's a father who lost a son. And so it's something very valuable, and it's something that you seek, when it's been lost. And it's something that when you find, you're excited about it. That's, the, that's what all of these parables are about. Right, now hang on to this one, it's incredible. So, and, and when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing, right? Because you gotta remember, the most important thing to you if you're a shepherd is your sheep. And you lose one, and you're going out looking everywhere for it, and when you find it, okay, there's rejoicing. And when he comes home, he gets everybody together and tells them, hey, listen, I found it, I found it, I found it, I found it. Hey, be excited with me here, right? Be excited with me here. For I have lost my sheep that was lost. I have found my sheep that was lost, okay? So we have then this picture of celebrating finding something you've lost. And the more valuable it is, the more you'll celebrate. The more valuable it is to you, right? That's what you need to hear. When we get to the lost son here in a minute, it'll come alive to you if you keep what I'm telling you in your mind. All right, here we go. All right, next one is the coin, right? Oh, no, no, hold on, hold on. She was lost. He said, just so, just so, this is the application. I tell you that there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 that don't need any repentance. Well, in reality, we all need repentance, right? But this is what he's saying is if you're already his, then the thing that really is a joy to, to our heavenly father is when, is when someone comes to know him. It says that, that he rejoices, joy. I don't even know how that works. I just know that Jesus is taking the time to tell us this and he's telling us this in three different ways. So if you and I, if you and I are his, then one of your drives you're going to have inside is to please him, right? To make him rejoice, right? And if you wanna know what really does, I think that's why Jesus is telling this story. This thrills him. If he can be thrilled, I don't even know how that works. How does that work when you're omnipotent, right? And I'm not present and all that thing. I have no idea how that works. I just know it's what Jesus is telling us, right? All right, really cool stuff. All right, good. So it goes on verse eight. What woman having, um, having 10 silver coins? You know, I looked at these coins and we think of 10 coins. It's, it, you know, it's not worth much. 
all right? But, but in this day, it was different. Uh, the fact that they're silver does make a difference. They, they gave a, a, there was one coin called a denarii or a denarius that basically was, was, you got one of them for a day's wages, for a common laborer's day wage. I think these are a little more valuable than that because these are silver. But I don't even know the context. I just know that in this particular time, it, it was very valuable. And so she, obviously, this lady had been saving up for something. This represented, this saving up represented something extremely important to her. I don't know what it was going toward or what it was for, but I just know it's something really important to her. And she lost one, right? And so what does she do, right? She lights a lamp. She turns the house upside down, right? Sweeps, seeks diligently until what? Until she finds it. And when she finds it, she tells everybody, hey, we can all breathe again, all right? Be excited with me here. I lost it, but now I found it, right? So Jesus is just relating these stories. Now, look at what he says, just so. This is the part of it. I tell you that there's joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, look here. Look at this verse. Keep it up there. The angels aren't rejoicing. Right? It's real easy to miss it reading it, right? Who's rejoicing? That one who is in the presence of the angels. And who would that be? That would be God the Father, right? So this thought is, because the next one is the parable of the prodigal son, it has to do with a father rejoicing. So we know who this, what these parables are talking about. And, the, and what it's talking about is the, is the celebration, the excitement that comes, that comes over God the Father's face. I don't even know how to say it. The celebration of God. Jesus is telling us that when one person comes to know him, you know, there's something about thrilling or exciting the one that you really love. You know, God help me, but I used to take my kids to Disney. And I know this is awful, but I was not a fan. Um, but my kids... Oh my goodness. You know, now you have to take out a loan to go. But, <laughs> but, you know, back when my kids were kids, okay, we had season passes. Oh, Lord, help me. And we, <laughs> it's like Chuck E. Cheese. Who wants to go to that place but kids? And so, but you'll go, why? Because when you look in their faces, they're thrilled at everything. I mean, this is everything. I mean, it's unbelievable. And why would you do that? Because you like exciting the people that you care most about, guys. And if we're his, you can, doggone it, you're gonna want to, this little bit of knowledge that you know that this is what thrills him. Thrills him. And so I just want you to see, this is not about us and our responsibility. This is about us understanding his point of view. Right? This is something that he longs for. All right, chapter 15, verse 11. Now, this is the parable of the prodigal son. Now that I've told you the context, right? And now that we understand this is about celebrating, just let this probably parable that most of you have heard before, just let it come alive as we read it. And you're going, oh, that's exactly what that's saying. And right, here we go. All right? And he said, there was a man with two sons. We've already talked about who those two sons are. I don't have enough time to talk about the oldest son. We can only talk about the the younger one, right? And the younger of them said to his father, Father, uh, give me the share of the property that, that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them, right? Now, again, the thing that you always have to remember, the thing that you always have to remember is that Jesus is telling this story to a Jewish audience. So if you really want to understand what Jesus is talking about, right? Basically, this is the ultimate insult to a parent. The ultimate dishonoring is when you have a kid look at you and say, hey, I want what you have, but I don't want anything to do with you. Does that make sense? This is basically, basically looking at your dad saying, I, I, you know, I wish you were dead. 
right? That's about as bad as it gets. Therefore, this kid wanted what he wanted, but he wanted nothing to do with the father who provided it all anyway. Isn't that interesting? And so it's, it, you gotta remember, if you can, if you can put yourself in a, in a Jewish audience back at this time, it helps you understand that as Jesus shared this story, they were a little aghast. And I, you know, because if you understand the Middle Eastern culture and a lot of other cultures over there, this whole family parent type thing, it's, it's very, even still to this day, it's pretty interesting, right? It's different than it is in our, in our country, right? All right? And not many days after the younger son gathered together all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country. So basically this kid, son, wanted to get as far away from his dad as he could. Why? Because he wanted to do, he wanted to do what he wanted to do without having to worry about dad looking over his shoulder or questioning what he was doing. Basically, I, I want what you got, but after you give me what you give me, I want to do with it as I want to do with it. Right? And so he did. He went off into a far country, which is, represents separation, right? The things that separate us from the God who loves us, right? Sin does, which is what this is, so it's a great picture. There's so much to this, but guys, I got to move on. Y'all got to listen faster, or we're not gonna get done, all right? So, I, but there's a lot more to this. I know I'm having to move past it, but I just wanna focus on several things today. And after that, he, he gathered, he went into a far country, and it says there he squandered his property in reckless living, okay? You know, it's an interesting thing today. Uh, basically, he just started to party, all right? And basically the, the thought was, you know, you always have lots of friends as long as the money holds out. And, uh, and again, people say to me, you know, because what happens is a famine always comes. And those who prepare for the pet famine are the ones that make it through the famine, the others don't. And when you live irresponsibly, guys, it's eventually going to happen. It just is the way it is. But guys, also I've learned too, it's, it's better for you if the money does run out. Because doing what I do, I'm gonna have an opportunity to be around a whole lot of people. And you and I live in a culture where most people think, man, if I had enough money and I'd party every day and I'd travel and I'd do, you say that and it might work out well for you for a while. But guys, when you indulge so much and your taste buds can't even taste it anymore, you'll know what I'm talking about. As long as it's cool, man, you don't think about it. Oh, yeah. But it runs out, and you know it runs out. That's what happened to this kid. It always runs out. It always runs out. But that's the very mes message of the... Why? Because you were created for something more. You were created for something more. I told you a story about a guy. I, I was a pastor over in South Tampa. 35 years old. Uh, multi. Multi. Very successful. Owned a company and sold a company, and then and then created another one. He was just real gifted and, and very wealthy and drove a big car and was a good looking single guy. And, and he, came, he started visiting and I'll never forget because he was very articulate and he could express himself, which I think is the cry of so many people from their hearts. He, he, he came up to me and he said, you know, Jeff, I, I don't know if what all you're talking about. Uh, I love real honest people, I really do. He said, I don't know about if all you're talking about is true, he said, but I do know this, that there's more to this, there, there's, there is more to this life than what I'm experiencing right now. And guys, this guy had it all, according to our world, right? And he knew, even though he still had it all. It's an amazing thing when you see this famine, this, what happens when you immerse yourself into it, it winds up being tasteless. Interesting. I right, got to move on. All right, so he goes on and said, and, and after he'd spent everything, that always happens, by the way, uh, a severe famine came into the, into the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a local, okay, with citizens of the country he was in, who sent him out in the field to feed pigs. Now, guys, I fed pigs lots of times in my life. Right, I mean, because as a kid, you know, and growing up, teenager, I was around my grandfather who had hogs all his life, and there's nothing wrong. But remember, this is a Jewish story. Okay, kosher, pigs. Okay, some of you are getting it. The other just go back to sleep. All right. So, anyway, so, so you got a Jewish kid out feeding pigs 
right? And he's working for a Gentile. Jesus is setting this story up, right? To where the audience that's listening will be kind of aghast. Kind of like, and that kid has gone low, low for his culture. And not only was he feeding the pigs, he was eating after them, okay? He was longing to be fed the pods, right, that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. Interesting. That's why it'll take you real low, right? You know, guys, I've learned that it's real hard to share with somebody as long as, they're, as, long as the money holds out. Y'all know what I'm talking about? But this life is not an easy one, right? Traumatic events hit. Famines come in, and it tests what you believe in, right? Famines, that's what famines do. Famines test what you believe in. You know, you're gonna go through many of them in your life, right? This past week, and a lot of you know, well, maybe a lot of you don't, and I'll share it with you, but Martha, uh, my wife, Martha, lost her father Wednesday, and Tuesday. We had the funeral service Friday in, in Charleston, Mississippi. When you're where I'm from, you omit syllables. It's not Mississippi, it's Mississippi, right? Y'all got it. All right. And so Charleston, Mississippi, I, there's a little one-room church and, and family graveyard out back, just like you would think. And so I was down there and, and sharing. I drove and, it was, and I was doing, doing a Miss Simpson, Martha's mom asked me to do it. And so... You know, this is standing room only in this little one room church, just like you think it would be. And as I was sharing, I don't know, it kind of overwhelmed me a little bit. And it reminded me, I lost my dad about a year ago, a little over a year and a half ago. And as I'm sharing with them, um, kind of looking at a lot of people that I love and seeing hurt, you know, obviously. But you know, and it just came out of my mouth, I said this. Yeah, I just don't know how people survive without Christ in their lives. How do you face a day like today where there's no hope, right? I mean, they're dead, they're gone, nothing else. Really? I, don't, I just don't know how people do it. But see, when, you've, when, you, when you hit up about it, at least this kid had the message. Most people live hopeless lives because they don't think it gets any better than this. They know something's missing, but they don't know what it is. Guys, that's the only responsibility you and I have is make sure they understand or make sure they hear. You couldn't change their life if they try, if you tried, but you can't share with them. Well, this kid know, right? This kid know, right? It says when he came to himself. Now, the thought here is, I, I love the NIV, I believe says he came to his senses. Therefore, he woke up and it hit his mind that, that he does know the answer and, um, and his dad, right, in this story. He said, how many of my fa father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I'm, I'm dying, I'm starving, I'm starving to death. He says, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna go home, right? And, uh, and, I'm going to, and he rehearses this little speech, right? Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, can I just have a job? He knows that he doesn't deserve anything. I tell you, whenever a person gets to a point in time in their life when they realize they don't deserve it, because you and I live in a culture where we think we all deserve it. I mean, if you ever can get there, then you can actually see the truth, all right? Well, this kid had learned, right? He just asking his dad to just, could I just have a job? And he rose and he came to his father. While he was still a long way off, he said his father looked down, looked down the road. So it shows me that probably several times a day, this dad passed by this road and looked down at just to see if his son was coming, right? And so he's walking back and he's felt compassion. It says, and he ran. Listen, only time in all of the Bible that God, the father, right? is portrayed as being in a hurry, right here, right? He ran down the road, ran, right? 
and he embraced him and he kissed him. You know, we have a, we have a Greek man in our church and he just couldn't help himself. He had to come back to me because you do know originally Greek is the original language. And he says, Jeff, do you know that word uh, for, for kissed him? Uh, I, I said, yeah, well, I looked it up. He says, well, no, 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 no. He says, we don't even have an English word. It means he kissed him again and again and again and again and again. Oh, okay, all right. I'll tell everybody next service, all right? <laughs> Actually, a man from Greece, all right? Just moved, I mean, moved here a few years ago and he's a great guy to listen to, right? I mean, anyway, so, but guys, I, I imagine this kid, I, I, I can only imagine what this kid looked like, but I do know what he smelled like. <laughs> if, you've ever, if you've ever smelled pig stuff, all right, you never forget it the rest of your entire life. It takes at least two days and several baths to get rid of it, all right? But his dad didn't care. He didn't care. And so he launches into his speech, Father, I've sinned against heaven for you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the dad stops him mid-speech. Quickly, he said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, put it on him. Ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. Lots of symbolism there, we don't have the time. Bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this is my son, he was dead. Now he's alive. It's my son, he was lost. Now he's found. Guys, one of the greatest things you and I have going for us is that you got a heavenly father that loves you. Does that make sense? Because there isn't anything. When you think of grace, it's a gift you don't deserve and, and this kid understood it. But I want you to know that God celebrates that. He celebrates it. Amazing. All right, number two. Now I've got enough time to share this one. This one's a little bit easier, but I didn't want you to miss this as you see them together. God's directive. This is what he's called us to do, right? And, and there's a great picture of it in the story of Jonah. Now, I could take six weeks to talk about it. There's so much in this, but I'm only going for one thing. God gave Jonah a job to do. At first, he refused, right? But... I want you to see what was, what was there, right? All right, let's take, let's take a look at Jonah. This is a great, great, great story. Most, so most people get caught up with the fish, all right? But just hang with me here, all right? Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up from before me. In other words, okay, listen, Nineveh, which was probably at the time of Jonah, the largest city to exist, and... Most, a lot of people think as many as a million people, but it was, it was evil. God says, okay, I mean, something's gonna have to be done here, but I wanna, give them, I wanna give them a chance. So Jonah, I want you to go tell them, right? But Jonah, it says here, rose up, right? And he ran, he fled to Tarshish, which if you look on the map, it's the exact opposite direction, right? He fled from the presence of the Lord, it says. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. Now listen, if you're gonna run from the Lord, don't get on a boat <laughs> or a plane, okay? They didn't have planes back then. And so anyway, so he, he went down and found a ship going, he paid for the fare and he went on to it, right? Now, now remember this, right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna tell you the rest of this little story here. Basically, if you know what happened, um, you know, start having a lot of storms, right? You know, and they were all calling on different gods and all this stuff, and they started throwing stuff off to lighten the ship to keep it from sinking. And, and Jonah goes to him and he says, hey, listen, just throw me overboard. I know why this is happening. Just throw me overboard. And they wouldn't do it. And, but after they kept trying, kept trying, kept trying, throw me overboard, they pitched him overboard. And, and God had prepared right? A great fish, the scripture says. Some people get real hung up on that. I, guys, I mean, God can do anything he wants to. You know, if he wants to, if he wants to grow a fish big enough to swallow a guy, he can do it, right? And so I, 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 people want to, want to naturally explain it. It says that God had prepared it. So anyway, so, so here to remember this, um, Jonah decided he was going to do what he wanted to do, and, and then God gave him a three-day cruise all right, if you know the story, right? And uh, 
And you know, it's interesting because there have been actual historical accounts, you can go online and read them, pretty fascinating, of different sailors who've been swallowed by whales, actually, who, mainly in whaling ships. And um, basically, there was one guy who was in, a, in, the, in the stomach, if you will, of a whale for 12 hours. And when they finally cut him out, all right, um, he was out of his mind, as you can imagine, and that they reported that his skin from the stomach acids, acids had been bleached white. God was just preparing him before he went through. Can you imagine walking through Nineveh looking like that? All right. So anyway, but again, that's Jeff. That's that's Jeff stuff. This is not in the scripture, right? I just tell him some of the things I found out. Anyway, so anyway, so basically, at the end of chapter two, this great fish vomited him up onto the shore, and then chapter three, verse one says, "In the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time." All right. Let's give, it a, let's give it another shot. You know, I'm here to say, this is who God's called us to be. And he is at work in your life teaching you this, you know? And sometimes it can be unpleasant, right? It's interesting, All right? And so go, go to Nineveh is the basic word, right? And, uh, and I want you to share them my word, right? And I'll tell it to you later. I just need you to go. So Jonah got up and he finally went, right? And he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey. So it's a three-day walk to get through it. Pretty incredible to think about for that time, right? And Jonah began to go into the city, going uh, going a day's journey. Now, here was his sermon. Here was God's word, right? Basically, it was one sentence with a comma. Okay, you guys have got 40 days, and this place is going down. That's it. Right? And you know, Jonah's heart wasn't even in it. He hated these people. And if you know anything about history, the, you know, they were pretty rough, brutal, especially when they did raids or conquered people, enslaved them, a lot of ugly stuff, right? But through Jonah, the people put their faith and trust in God. Look at verse five. And they begin to repent fast put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them, right? You can look at the rest of it, it's pretty cool. Kind of just, even the king got involved and, and, uh, and they responded. Guys, by grace through faith, it's, all, it's an amazing, gosh, it's an amazing message. You can talk about 500 different ways, but it all comes down to, it's a gift, they don't deserve it. It's a gift God gives. If you do believe it, it'll change your life change your destiny. It did theirs, right? Anyway, chapter four, verse one. So after they repented and, you know, I mean, I, John is the only evangelist in history that he goes into a town and preaches and a me and people come to know Christ and he's upset about it. Y'all hear me? It's interesting. So anyway, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He was, he was, he was angry and he prayed to the Lord and said, oh Lord, <laughs> he blamed God for this. See, I knew this was going to happen. And then, interesting, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> right? Lord, is not what I said was going to happen while I was still in my own country. Right? That's why I went the other way to Tarshish. For I know God what? I know that, number one, I know you're gracious. Interesting, huh? Amazing grace. Right? Number two, I know you're patient. Right? And number three, you abound in love, steadfast love. That's what I'm telling you. You may not see it. God, I pray you open your eyes and let you see it. But one of the greatest things that you and I have going for us is that God loves us. I mean, unbelievable, right? And relenting from disaster, therefore now, here, here's Jonah. God just killed me. I'd rather be dead. I'd, I'd absolutely rather be dead, right? And the Lord says, do you do, you do well to be angry? And Jonah went, uh, he went out into the city in the east of the city and, and he made a booth for himself, which is like a little, you know, it's a little thing that they set up and they put fronds on it just to get in out of the weather. And, um, and he sat there in the shade until he could see what was gonna happen to the city. In other words, he's sitting up on a hill looking, hoping that somehow they're gonna mess up and God's gonna zap them because he really wants them zapped. Seriously, I mean, just read it, let it speak, right? 
But guys, you have to remember, this is, why didn't Jonah want to share God's word with these people? Because he wanted them to get what they deserved. Right? Hatred, prejudice even. Right? A lot of time, most of the reason people, believers today, don't share is just simply got a fear of what other people might think of them. Right? Does that make sense? But whatever it is that keeps us from sharing, right? That's what we need to attack. Right? Anyway, but let's see what happened to Jonah. So uh, now the Lord appointed a plant, right? And made it to come up, to grow up over Jonah. Basically, basically just in a short amount of time. And that it might shade his head and that it might save him from his discomfort. You know, that's why I tend to think that maybe discomfort was from the bleaching of his skin, you know? Again, I don't know in the, in the, in the sun, but... And it says that, that Jonah was real excited about the plant. All right? Real excited about the plant. But when dawn came the next day, God appointed, appointed on purpose appointed a worm that attacked the plant and it withered. If you've ever seen it, these little worms drill a hole right through the bottom part of the plant and just, right? In a heat like that, it doesn't take long. I, said, yeah, but I don't believe a plant like that can grow up overnight. Oh, listen, guys, God can do, he created everything anyway. He can do anything he wants to. I've never had a problem with those things because if God can truly create you and I and everything in this perfect environment, he can, he can, a plant can grow, all right? So anyway, uh, I don't know why people get hung up on things like that. But anyway, but when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind. Now this was all God appointed. Why? Because he needed to teach Jonah. And what does God need to teach us, right? And by the way, Jonah didn't have to be thrown off that boat. If he'd just gone ahead and done what God had told him the first time, no problem. But some of us have to learn harder ways. You know, I, I have four kids. Now, for two of them, if I, if I would look down at them and I'd say, no, they would say, yes, daddy. Right? Now, I had another one that I would say, no. And she'd say, well, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> but then the other one, she was something else. I would say, no. And she would say, yes, daddy, and then go do it anyway. <laughs> Does that make sense? So you learn Sometimes you learn the hard way, but if God, if you truly are his, he'll make sure you learn it. So a scorching wind comes up. I mean, just scorched his head and he was faint. And then what had happened? He wanted to die again. <laughs> right, just kill me. It's better that I die than I live, right? And then he goes on, God says to him, do you do well to be angry for the plant? All right, and he goes, he's just, he's mad. I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Yeah, okay. All right. And Lord said to him, you pitied the plant for which you didn't do anything. You didn't labor it. You didn't make it grow. It came into being at night and it perished. Right? Interesting. He goes on to say, should I not pity Nineveh? That great city in which there's more than 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left, which that probably is referring to children, right? Who haven't grown up enough to know their right from their left hand, right? You know, left. So I taught my kids, the L. They have to know L though. But, so we're talking at least a million people. And so what is he telling Jonah? It's gonna be tough folks to hear if you're his today. What's he telling Jonah? You care more about the plant than you do people. That's what he's telling Jonah. You care more about your own comfort, right? The plant, than you do about an entire city dying, right? And what he's trying to get Jonah to see, I want you to look at my perspective, right? I want these people to know, right? That there is hope, there is a chance. Interesting, huh? You see these two together. First thing you see, God's heart, right? And the love, his love for us and commitment and, and patience is one of the greatest things we have going through. But also, if you are his today, he wants you to be a part of it. He wants to be a part, you to be a part of just sharing it. All you have to do is just share it, right? Remember, Jonah didn't even share it. He had no heart, right? 
In fact, he was, he was hoping it wouldn't work. So I think he just went through, okay, guys, you got 40 days. 40 days, you are done. And that's all he did, right? Because he didn't want it to work. But it's not about you. It's his message, not yours. It's the message that changes your life. That's unbelievable. I, I got to stop. I got to stop. But I just, guys, that's the passion behind what we're talking about this series, whatever it takes, just whatever it takes. And I'm looking forward to these next couple of months. I really am. Who knows what God's going to do? But the one thing I do know is that when he does it, it'll be life-changing and I'm looking forward to it, all right?